All right. Good morning and welcome to the WellMed Charitable Foundation. We are so blessed today to have Dr. Elliot Montgomery Sklar and Lucy Barilla going to tell us and talk about family dynamics and when it's absolutely necessary to think about placement or your care for the caregiver to think about it to place their loved one or their care receiver. So let me tell you a little bit about these two experts. Um, Lucy Barilek has a master's degree in social work from McGill University. She's presently working as a consultant for a health network in Montreal. And she has been involved in various research projects, published numerous articles related to care caregiving issues. She's lectured at several universities and colleges on innovative approaches to caregiving and presents annually at international and national conferences. Lucy's a consultant for private industry in the United States, including her work with the WellMed, Char the WellMed Charitable Foundation and their clinics in Texas. In addition, Lucy would like you to know that mm -hmm. she was a caregiver for her own mother for about 10 years. Now, Elliot, Dr. Elliot Montgomery Sklar is a public health professional with two decades of experience in supporting the health of the public through academic work, research, and service. He has led healthy aging programs for seniors and for caregivers in Canada, in the United States, and virtually, so basically around the world. And his research is focused on the complexity of issues related to aging and caregiving. Dr. Sklar is an associate professor of healthcare sciences at Nova Southeastern University in Florida. <laughs> He's also recently published research in the American Journal of Occupational Therapy, the Journal of Applied Gerontology, and the Journal of Social Services Research on themes related to this program. So please welcome our guest speakers, Elliot and, and Lucy. Hello. Hey. Go ahead, Elliot. I was just saying hello. Oh, hi. <laughs> that's what we like about our sessions. We're very informal and we that's why we also very much appreciate when people join us. So good morning. Thank you, Evelyn, for that and welcome. Let me just go over what we're talking today. It's what should seniors consider and, and explore before deciding to live with relatives? How do family dynamics play uh, a role? What should relatives know? So this is, you know, a trend that's happening now. Extended caregiving can bring on tension within family dynamics and added stress. And this has been the case for many people. But this has been highlighted during our experience of the pandemic and what has come since. You know, there is high inflation, supply chain shortages, staff shortages, and challenges um, accessing health care. So this month, our series has focused on information about how to age in place and make changes in your home and how the pandemic changed our view of long-term care. You know, we also talked about staffing shortages in nursing homes and how to cover expenses of long-term care. One of the results of the pandemic is that there are more intergenerational households and more families opting to delay placement of a care a person either entirely or for as long as possible. You know, we've talked about what uh, to think about if you're placing someone in long-term care, but, if, but what if you are thinking of have, having your care recipient live with you? That means you want your loved one to live with you. What should you be thinking about then? Today, we're going to explore some of the interpersonal dynamics involved in caregiving and shared experience of our participants. So we hope that you will join us uh, and share your ideas and thoughts. We received uh, some interesting questions from participants over the month that we'll share with you today. Caregiving can be a very rewarding experience, but also very challenging. And I know that on a personal level. We have received a lot of questions from children caring for their parents and about conflicts that have come up because of the interpersonal issues or the demands of caregiving role. There's always difficulty and important questions. You know, these are really important questions when it comes to caregiving for our loved one. And even more, if we don't especially like or love that person that we are now caring for. So how will you care for your loved ones at home? These are questions we should think about. 
who will look after them, how will expenses be paid, watching the strength and independence decline in someone you love is difficult for anyone to witness. When you combine the emotions, the stress, and the predisposition of a whole family, it's understandable that tensions may arise. So what I want to tell you is communication is key when choosing which family member will be responsible for what kinds of care, support, and help with tasks. For example, who lives closest, who has the most free time outside of their daily responsibilities. And it's important to uh, revisit those things occasionally and not to assume that just because your caregiving responsibilities feel manageable, other family members may feel it is too much on them. Feeling overwhelmed by caregiving responsibilities for a prolonged period of time could be a signal that it's time to consider looking at options, including placing a loved one and some of the questions we received today touch about that. So we have a lot to share with you. Absolutely. Um, you know, as our program is titled, um, this series this month has focused upon hot topic issues related to aging and caregiving. Right now, October 2022, moving into November. So in the last week, news stories across the country have surfaced, and you might have seen some of them, about seniors being unable to handle living, really due to soaring costs. Oops, sorry. Um, and yes, you know, certainly beneficiaries of supplemental social security income will be getting an extra 144 whopping dollars in their monthly <laughs> checks, starting at the end of the year, um, the very end, like the last day of the year. But this cost of living adjustment for 2023 is 8.7% equating to that $144. Now, um, according to Social Security, the maximum monthly payout is $841 and the average benefit is $621 nationwide. Just not possible to live on that. In 2020, 9.5% of elders lived in poverty. That number has increased to about 11% this year. And that's a, quite a big jump. Uh, it doesn't necessarily seem like it, but it is uh, in terms of looking at trends over the last decades. Now, over 15 million Americans 65 and older are economically insecure living at or below the federal poverty level. And that is $25,760 for a single person in 2021. Again, hard to live on that. So living on a fixed income really can't compete with the inflation that we have been witnessing these days. Years ago, Florida was a haven for retirees, um, but cost of living here has skyrocketed. And I use this just as an example. The Miami Herald reported last week that many seniors cannot afford rent or food. And for those that own homes, home insurance rates are so high that many cannot afford to insure their homes. In the wake of Hurricane Ian, home insurance rates are expected to rise 20 to 40% on a premium for the year. A home insurance policy for a modest 1,500 square foot home in Florida can easily run around 10,000 a year on top of deductibles. So think about that and, and taxes and everything else, even if you own your home out, outright. It's not just in Florida. The Los Angeles Times reported suicide suicide increasing among seniors because they don't know how to be able to afford to live with mounting inflation and rents being completely unaffordable. The New York Times had an article about the number of grandchildren who are moving in with grandparents in order to attend college in New York City. This was really interesting. Rents have become so outrageous and since many older residents of the city have lived in units for a long time, some of them have rent control making it the only option for younger people to be able to move in. So in our current environment of inflation and high costs of living, there are impacts upon aging and caregiving. And earlier in our series this month, we talked about home modifications and budgeting for long-term care. But the cold hard fact is that a lot of people cannot afford long-term care or they feel uncomfortable with placement or they're on a wait list, or they haven't planned. 
All of these things can have a domino effect around the person providing care. Many people who are making decisions are making those decisions based upon what they can and cannot afford, which is very different than making decisions based upon what we need. Sometimes those decisions lend to cohabitation or living with friends and family. New data from the National Health Poll on Healthy Aging that was published earlier this year has suggested that many people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s need to do a lot more planning than they have if they want to avoid or delay needing to move from their home. The poll also showed differences in aging in place readiness among around 28% of older adults who live alone. All in all, 88% of people between the ages of 50 and 70, I'm sorry, 50 and 80, said it was very or somewhat important that they stay in their homes as long as possible. But of those 88%, only 15% had given consideration to how their home might actually need to be modified as they age. And 47% had given it little or no thought. I know it's a lot of statistics, but I'm a researcher, so this is what helps to inform things. Uh, you know, I, I think it really just highlights the fact that that a lot of people are not making the plans or preparations because it's not something a lot of people want to think about. But then we run into an issue. Um, you know, 48% of people uh, who live alone said that they do not have anyone in their lives who could help them with things like bathing or personal care if needed. So I, that really hit me because I think, you know, what happens if something happens to you and then who do you call? Um, I'm sure that we know many people who might be in that situation living alone and, and aging. Um, and as for hiring help, only 19% of older adults in that report said that they felt confident that they could afford to pay someone to help with household chores, grocery shopping, personal care, and on the other hand, nearly two thirds of those who called their current physical or mental health status fair or poor said that they were not confident or not very confident that they could afford help. So this is why we're here and we're talking today because taking steps to understand what's available in the community is very important through the elder care locator, which we'll share at the end of our program with our resources, your local area agency on aging, Usually certain communities have nonprofit groups and other sources that can help older adults to be more prepared as well. Family members can also help to encourage older adults to find out what's available. Many people don't realize it, but Medicare does cover home health aids in some circumstances. So this kind of information is really crucial to know. And we have the link here, um, which can help you to learn more about what criteria needs to be met. Many people don't know about this option, and what was surprising to me is that many doctors don't either, even though they're part of the process in establishing medical necessity for those home health aides. So all of these things can put a strain on caregivers and extended family members. Well, that's really a lot of um, food for thought, Elliot, that's for sure. You know, we do receive quite a few uh, questions from our audience, and we'd like to share a few today. So let's start with, um, with this one. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, my parents are in their late 80s and live on their own. My father has Alzheimer's and my mother is in pretty good shape for someone of her age. Uh, though caring for my dad takes a toll on her. They don't drive, so ahead of the pandemic, my brother and I took them to appointments, took care of their groceries and prescription, took my mother to the hair salon and anything they needed. During the pandemic, my brother and his family relocated. Before then, we switched up responsibilities and my brother would look after my dad while I take my mom to get, uh, to get her some respite. I live alone and work full time, and this now leaves all of the responsibilities on my shoulders and no opportunity to provide my mom respite and be all things to all people. I've participated in your programs and used some of your tips you shared about using home delivery services for groceries or even having an Uber pickup and take them on, on appointments. 
uh, if I was working. I tried that and relieved me of some stress and freed up some of my time. The problem is that my mother doesn't like having a stranger choose and deliver her groceries and she doesn't like taking rides from a stranger. I tried to explain again and again that I can be all things to all people, which results in us fighting. I feel resentful of my brother and upset to be in this situation. What can I say? Thank you for your question, for sure. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people out there are going through similar situation, but I hear how upset you are. And under the circumstances, you have reasons to feel as you do. You know, it is time to acknowledge your own needs. Otherwise you will become more resentful and become overwhelmed. You need to think about your own needs. I know it's not easy to do, but I think that's the beginning process. Once you realize that you're in a situation where, you know, you're getting angry, you got to kind of make a decision. So let's look at like, this is just a start, okay? I think it's important to make a checklist of responsibilities or things that you can do to help your parents and see what is manageable. Communicate with your mother about what you can and cannot do and see if you can find some compromise. Okay, let her know how difficult it's been for you. Let her know how much you care for both of them, but that you need to set limits for yourself so that you don't become overwhelmed and not take care of yourself and, 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 and not deal with your physical or your mental issues. It's important to uh, contact your local uh, AAA to see if there is senior rights services in your community. So your mom <coughs> potential for a consistent driver if you can. There may be additional services in the community that can be of benefit. It's things that she might accept and, and, and actually welcome. You can, uh, you, you know, can your parents, you need to talk about this, it might not be easy, but can your parents afford a home health aid to provide your mom with, with respite or, you know, to take on any other tasks that you are not able to do? You know, would your parents consider a living uh, community that has transportation and meal service as an option? You know, this is really just a beginning. Uh, the big, what I mean by that is don't let this fester. If you don't deal with it, it's just gonna get worse. You're gonna get angrier and more upset and there's no solutions. So, you know, it's important. Communication is the key, I believe in all situation. Communicate your feelings. And set limits, it's not easy, but take it one step at a time and see you know, how you can move forward with that. So I wish you all the very best. I don't know, Elliot, if you wanna add a few other little things or anybody else, I would more than welcome that. Sure, well, does anyone participating <laughs> today have a similar experience and any tips that they would like to share? So folks, please, if you're on the phone, just press star six to unmute yourself, or you can unmute yourself on Zoom. We would love to hear from you. Lucy, you reminded me about uh, our connection call yesterday. Uh, Dr. Barry Jacobs talked about dealing with loved ones or care recipients with personality disorders. And it was all about setting limits and being able to say, no, no, I can't do all, I can't do any more, or we need to get somebody else. And it's that or nothing. You know, it's people really need to get to the point where they feel like they have to take care of themselves first. Exactly. Because as I said, it just festers and gets worse. If you don't express your feelings and if you don't acknowledge them and talk about them, you're, get, you're, you're gonna get nowhere with that. So, you know, and to set your limits to understand what you can and cannot do. It's not easy, it's difficult, but it's manageable. And I know I'm, I'm saying I can relate to that because I've had to do that as well in my caregiving journey with my mother. And the, the, one of the things that I really did right when I decided that I needed to take care of myself while working, my kids, my family, I couldn't visit her as often as I did before. And I felt very guilty about that. But once I made that decision and spoke to her about it, it worked out. It was okay. She accepted it. 
very important. I, um, I had a colleague who was actually faced with a similar situation. Um, and she wound up um, moving into the condo complex where her parents were living as a way of making things easier on herself. Hmm. Um, and, you know, that was an interesting solution. Um, now, for example, when she has to go do groceries for herself, they all go together. Or if her mom needs respite, her dad will come and visit with her and they watch TV while she's doing laundry or other things so her mom can get out. Um, it wound up actually making their interactions much better, but I recognize it's not an option or a solution for everyone. Um, you know, one of the areas of focus of our program today is how to make decisions about having a loved one move in with you. And this is a difficult thing, I think, for many caregivers, and one that more and more people are facing because of the high cost of care and the high cost also of living. So if you decide to have an elderly parent or other aging relative move in with you, you're certainly not alone. In fact, one out of every four caregivers lives with the, um, with the care recipient. So this arrangement can certainly have many positives. If your parent or your loved one is still relatively healthy, then he or she, for example, might be able to babysit or help around the house or just contribute financially or get to know your children, for example, in a way that would have not been possible with only occasional visits. But recognizing this may not be right for everyone. So we have put some sort of questions here together for you to help with some decision making. Now, the first one is what kind of care will the person need? What is the person's physical and mental condition? And what chronic illnesses does he or she have? I think these are first the very important questions you need to look at because um, you need to understand the progression of the disease and, and what will be needed and all of those things. So if they're still relatively healthy and independent, this may be the best time to move in together. Um, also so that that person will become more accustomed to the new surrounding. And as I mentioned earlier, can participate in uh, the dynamics and activities of your family and your household. Now, most people don't consider caring for an elderly parent in their own home until the person has had some sort of health crisis. And in that case, it's very likely that you'll be, you know, coping with the person's illness. Um, and it's important to learn about the illness, the progression, as I mentioned, uh, and, and how much care is needed. How much assistance then can you provide? Uh, it's really important, I think, to be realistic about what we can and cannot do. When we take care of someone, you know, we certainly want to nurture them and give back to them in the way that they gave back to us or that they gave to us. Um, and when you take care of someone, you provide a model also, I think for showing others around you what caring and commitment mean. I think it can prepare family members. Um, and, you know, as I said, it sets a good example, but you have to be realistic. Consider your schedule. Um, one of the things that many people don't consider is sleep disruption. People um, who have sleep disruption or sleep issues can upset the rhythm and routine of a whole household. And if you have kids that have to get up and go to school in the morning, that can become an issue. So I think, you know, these are things that need to be considered. Also, if the person needs help with bathing, dressing, going to the bathroom, are you comfortable helping with that? If they're incontinent, can you change a diaper? Are you comfortable with that? Would you need to find an in-home health aid? So these are all really, really important things. And as I mentioned, the sleep disruption, for example, if a person needs help going to the bathroom during the night, are you gonna be the one waking up to, to do that? Um, sleep deprivation is, is a very real thing. And I think it's something that a lot of people do need to think about. And, and um, how they would get rested or nap time if they needed it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes these are also reactionary decisions to a health crisis. So you really need to think about that and ask yourself if this is um, a decision that you should be making right now or if this is a crisis. And who else needs to be involved in that decision-making? Who else lives with you? Um, 
I think it's very important to involve all of these people in the decision-making process. Think about whether you have the time, the energy, the ability to take all this on. And who's going to be participating in the decision-making, as I said? Uh, there should be a lot of consideration and thought-out conversation, including all stakeholders. And that can also involve extended family or close friends and the person that you're considering taking in if they're able to make decisions for themselves. Now, we, uh, Evelyn, you alluded to that issue of how well you get along and the interpersonal dynamics. And I think it's important that we look at histories of the relationship we have with the person who we would consider taking in. If you enjoy each other's company and you can easily resolve differences, that's a real plus. That doesn't mean that you can never argue or you have to be best friends, but all families do have some conflict. And if you are both able to get over that pretty easily, you've already done a lot of the groundwork. Mm -hmm. um, you may also be able to bond with this person in a new way and forge a newer relationship as adults too. Your children, as I said, if you have them, can get a better opportunity to know that person as well. But if the two of you never really got along, it would not be realistic to expect under these circumstances that that would change all of a sudden. When the person visits you, if you're grinding your teeth after an hour, or if you feel like running out the door, then having that person move in is maybe not the best idea. You may feel like you're doing the right thing, but if you're both going to be miserable, it's probably wiser to pursue other options. Certain conditions too, like Alzheimer's disease and some forms of dementia can change a person's personality. And that's something that you also need to consider. This change can be for the better sometimes and for the worse. How will you be able to handle things when their disease progresses or there may be a shift in their mood? The two of you may have always had a good relationship, but dementia can make people angry or paranoid in ways you haven't seen before. So these are, you know, I know a lot of things to, to think about, but they're things that are very important ahead of making a decision to have someone relocate and move in with you. And last but not least, uh, is your home aging friendly? Um, we talked about home modifications earlier in our series, but sometimes these can be very considerable in terms of cost. Uh, we provided a lot of nifty tips if you're renting and things that are Sort of hacks on the cheap. Um, we did that this time because of the high cost of inflation, materials, um, labor, and that's important to consider right now. Um, so if you want to refer back, as Evelyn said, that session is recorded and available. But uh, in a nutshell, um, would the person be living on the first floor? Uh, is there a bathroom on the first floor? Do they need wheelchair access or a walker? Um, some people don't realize it, but for a wheelchair, doorways need to be at least 32 inches wide. And on some older homes, that might not be the case. So yeah. would you need to redo your doorways? Um, would one of your kids, if you have them, need to give up a bedroom? Um, that's a big consideration, too. And if there's no extra bedroom, what would you be converting then into one? Um, a living room, an attic, a basement? Um, you have to really think about those things. The costs involve the privacy level that everyone will be comfortable with um, and how to pay for those things. So I, I know, as I said, it's a lot to think about, but it's a major decision. And uh, ideally, it should be one that you think about when there is no crisis. And that's really the purpose of our program today. Well, thank you for that, Elliot. I'm just wondering, um, is anyone in our participating today, are you living with someone that you're caring for? And would you like to share your experience or any tips that you have? We did get a chat from Luann oh. who said this topic includes many big decisions which should be discussed early on by the family before the need occurs. So I'm, I'm not the only one thinking that way, which is nice to see. And thank you for the comment. Does anyone else have any comments or questions? We'd love to hear from you folks. Just open up your phone by pressing star six or unmute yourself if you're on Zoom. I've got a little website and I can see, you know, who's who wants to talk. We would love to hear from you. Place one, of, one of my doctoral students um, 
during the course of the pandemic had his mother-in-law move in with him and his family. Um, and they have three small kids and he thought it would be a win-win for everyone. Um, but what he didn't anticipate was that it changed the dynamic between him and his wife. And um, he didn't count on the issues not having to do with the care recipient, but rather with other relationships in his household. And that's not uncommon. Yeah, there's many things to consider. For example, my mother would smoke a pack a day cigarettes. Yeah. My daughter at that time was asthmatic. So even though in my mind, I always had that extra room that I thought would be for her in the bathroom, it couldn't happen because she, you know, could not give up her smoking and I could not have my daughter be exposed to that. So these are so many things to take into consideration. It's very difficult to make these decisions. We got another uh, question uh, which which quite an unusual one, I have to say. I've never heard this one before. I'm an only child and my parents got divorced when I was in high school many, many years ago. My parents never remarried and each live alone. I've always been close with each one of them. My father was diagnosed with dementia a few years ago. And as it progressed, we decided that he would live with me and my family. My mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease just ahead of the pandemic. And as her condition deteriorated during the pandemic, we had, uh, had her move in with us too. It's been very strange to have both of my parents under the same roof for me personally. Lately, my mother has been acting out and yelling at my father. She behaves very aggressively towards him and I've had to separate them. Not sure how to handle this. It is just, a, is it just a phase in the progression of her illness or if I need to consider placing her in a nursing home? The thought of it is very difficult for me because I feel like I'm choosing one parent over the other. I've mm -hmm. talked to different people who have different opinions and I'm curious to get yours. Thank you in advance. Wow, that's really a loaded question, but I wanna thank you for your question, you know. You are in a very difficult situation and I truly feel for you and the rest of the family, I have to say that. But keep in mind, you did write that lately your mother's behavior towards your father has changed. She becomes very aggressive towards him. The first thing that I um, would wanna know is, is really she, she needs to have an appointment with her doctor because if this is something new that's happening, um, there could be something medically uh, going on, like she might have a urinary tract infection, she might be dehydrated, or something else that is causing her to behave in this manner. Maybe she's on new medications. I don't know, but I would. this would be my first uh, reaction that I would want her to be assessed by the doctor to make sure that everything is okay medically. But it's also very important to have a family meeting with the rest uh, of, of your family, you know, because they're involved in that. They see it. So let them know how stressed you are and see who can support you and your parents for the time being. You, you don't, um, uh, you know, you don't need to, to do this alone. I don't know how old your children are, so it's kind of difficult for me to kind of say how much they can support you. But it's important to also listen to what they're going through, and it might be interesting for you to know. Uh, you might want to consider counseling because there's a lot of issues here. It's almost a bit, it's as if you have to make a choice between who you're going to take care of, and that's a big issue to deal with. Even, you know, even with effective communication and cooperation among family caregivers, you may need help resolving conflicts or coping with stress. Uh, you seem to be a, you know, under a lot of that. You might join a support group, seek family counseling, as I said, or ask for advice from your medical care team. Um, not only about your mom, but about your father as well. So you need working through conflicts can help you move on to more important things. So what I want to say is really start by having a family conference, take your mom to the doctor, and one step at a time. 
And then also you can get in touch with your triple A just to see if there are other services available. Maybe your mother would be really, uh, would enjoy going to a day program, which will kind of separate and give you some respite, a little bit respite, uh, if she seems to, if it's, if, if she's able to do that or any other means where any other um, group that she might be able to join. So get support. You don't need to, this, to do this alone and you definitely need help. So I hope that's a helpful suggestions and I would really appreciate anyone else just letting us know, Evelyn, Elliot, participants, we're here. I'm here to listen. Great suggestions, Lucy. It's our tough I, situation. Very tough situation, and one that I think um, many people are facing but don't widely discuss. Um, in fact, baby boomers um, have a very high divorce rate, um, the highest among any of our senior populations of previous generations. And that leaves a lot of the caregiving responsibilities to children as opposed to a spouse. Um, so it's a very interesting issue, and I, I don't think that this person is alone. Um, we have talked about uh, this online support community called Seven Cups, which is the world's largest online support community. Um, and I would venture to guess that there might be some other caregivers there who have had some similar experiences. Alzheimer's also has a, um, a chat room now that is called alzconnected.org, which really, you know, you can put in what you like this question and have other people respond to it later. So that might help too. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, that is one of our resources that we will be sharing the link to them at the end of our program today. Um, Alzheimer's disease is a very challenging uh, disease. Um, and I see we have something in the chat box, Area Agency on Aging. What are some ways to best work and or utilize services? Do caregivers have input with this organization? Committees, advisory board, I'm in Texas. Great question. So area agency on aging exists all throughout the country. Um, some of them have different resources, different goals and objectives. They serve different communities. And so they would vary to some degree. Um, we always recommend reaching out to your local area agency on aging. They do have a number of services that are consistent. Uh, for example, they have social workers and they have case managers. Um, they can put you in touch with home health aid organizations if needed um, and help you see what you qualify for as well. Um, other communities, for example, uh, like in Miami where I, I've lived for a long time, there are um, committees and advisory boards. For example, there is an elder affairs group that I'm a part of through the health department. And many health departments will have community advisory boards as well as um, what are known as consortia of health. Um, and these are groups that uh, include a lot of nonprofit organizations in the community, members of the health department, uh, members of health systems and hospitals, and all together, you help to set the agenda as far as what the goals, objectives, needs are. Um, so depending on where you are in Texas, I would look locally to see what type of elder affairs groups or uh, committees might exist. And Evelyn, you might have some input as well. <laughs> I just saw me open my mouth. <laughs> I just was going to say that Area Agencies on Aging are the recipient of the National Caregiver um, Program that was funded maybe 10 years ago now. And they all have caregiver specialists. So if that's what you feel like you need somebody to talk to, you know, somebody to counsel on what's going on in terms of your caregiving role, you know, you can call them and ask for a caregiver specialist. Absolutely. And as I mentioned, different communities work very differently. Um, Mayor of Miami Dade um, that was elected um, a couple of years ago has um, been much more involved in public health and community health um, and has set a lot of initiatives related to aging and affordable housing and things like this. So it might differ depending on where you live, but I certainly encourage people to be active. And um, even if you just listen into those meetings, it gives you a good sense of where the funding is going. Um, 
you might learn about things that you had no idea. I found out actually that there was um, uh, a community fund to do gardening, um, plant trees, flowers, bushes in people's homes uh, who were aging in place to help them enjoy their environment a little bit better. Um, you know, it's not something that I would have thought of as being a, a critical need or something that was top of mind, but if you can get some free bushes planted in front of your house to look at every day, why not do that? Um, something that I started sharing earlier, and I'm being sensitive to our time today as well. Um, earlier in the year, I had attended the American Society on Aging meeting, and there were some really amazing and innovative presentations that I was able to attend. Um, one of them focused very much on um, wandering. And I think it's one of the biggest concerns for caregivers who have a loved one at home who wanders um, and the fear that they may get lost. So we, um, we wanted to talk a little bit about this before. Um, I've mentioned in the past that there are technologies like Siri and Alexa, and you, know, you can dispatch them from your phone if you fall. But there are other devices like smartwatches and even tiles that are becoming very popular to help track people who wander. So if a person is wearing a smartwatch or it has a, a tile, for example, tied to their shoelace, um, you can actually track them with an app on your phone. And uh, that's something that we never really had the ability to do before. Um, so if you do have a loved one with Alzheimer's or related dementia, I know the font here is small. We will be giving these handouts and the link is there at the bottom to the Alzheimer's uh, Association. Um, I can't underscore enough how important it is to consider enrolling in a national emergency response service that helps to facilitate the return of people home who uh, do have Alzheimer's or related dementia and who wander or who might have a medical emergency. There are a lot of really nifty and novel tips that I learned about that you can do in your home. Uh, these are some other home modification things if you are thinking of having someone move in with you. But if you place deadbolts out of the line of sight, so if you place them, for example, high up on a door or very low, um, that can be very helpful in um, deterring someone from being able to open a door. Um, people don't usually look up or down to where they can open a lock. It's usually right in front of you. It's also sometimes a great idea to cover doorknobs with cloth or something else that is the same color as the door so that the knob is camouflaged. Um, it was very interesting how some of the research showed that simply doing that helped to deter people from leaving the house. Um, there were other um, suggestions to use black tape uh, to create a two foot or, you know, or so threshold in front of the door. It actually acts as a visual barrier. So when people see that the, the ground is a different color there, um, they might not want to cross it. Um, and there was a lot of research to back that up, which was really quite interesting. You can also easily install warning bells or motion detectors above doors. Um, you don't need to have wiring to do this now. There are a lot of things you can get on Amazon, even um, uh, pool gate alarms for infants that sound when a, when a door is opened can be very helpful and they work on battery. Very easy to install. Um, you know, I, I think all these things are important because the stress experienced by families and caregivers who have someone who is lost and who wanders, it's very significant. So having a place, uh, uh, having a plan rather in place beforehand is very important so that you know what to do in case of emergency because most people want to panic. So if you have someone at home, again, please enroll them in a wandering service. Ask your neighbors, friends, and family to call if they see that person in the neighborhood walking around or inappropriately dressed for the weather, for example, that happens often. Keep a recent close-up photo of the person on your phone so that if you have to sh share or circulate that photo, you can do so easily. And also create a list of places that the person might wander to. It's very common for them to want to go to past jobs or a former house in the neighborhood or places of worship or a restaurant. So again, at the bottom of the screen, we have uh, the resources for you um, 
and we will share our slides as well after our presentation today. I know we're low on time. Um, I did want to ask if anyone had any tips or suggestions or questions, or if you've heard of any of these um, tips before to help deter someone from leaving or wandering. Uh, some of them were new to me, and I thought that they were very uh, creative. We did get a um, message in the chat, modification. Mm -hmm. Has anyone been presented with a non-mobile person to be able to get out of a home in the event of a fire? No time to get out of a wheelchair or Hoyer lift. We recently had an emergency exit to roll the hospital bed out. However, these modifications done are deemed unsafe. I know there has, been, uh, has to be more people who need an emergency plan to get out of the home. It's creating a lot of anxiety. That's an excellent, excellent question. My suggestion is check with your local AAA. There are uh, funds and resources. And again, I was talking about medical necessity and Medicare earlier. Um, if, you need, uh, if, you, if you need to make certain home modifications, uh, some of them may be covered, some of them may not, but that might help you in then having to make a decision about where that person can be in terms of safety. That's an excellent question, because certainly most homes are not equipped to be able to roll someone in a bed out of. And not a question that we've had before. No, that's what makes this so interesting. Sure does. More things for us to add next time. Anybody else? Please, we'd love to hear from you. We've got a couple minutes left. <laughs> yeah. We all work without our glasses sometimes. <laughs> They're in the other room. Well, Elliot, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna play bad guy here. The question: family dynamics. When is it absolutely necessary for a caregiver to place their loved one? I don't think has been answered yet. We're not done with our presentation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, that's why I said I'm being mindful of time. Okay, go. All right. Okay, so here's another question. My wife was recently diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. I'm retired and we have been married for 52 years. I have no intention of ever placing her in a long-term care facility, but I've also never worked in healthcare or had to care for anyone. I wanted to know if there are, are, are there courses I could take to prepare me with the skills I might need. As I write that, I realize that I'm not even sure what skills I would need. Well, here is a very devoted person. Thank you. You know, thank you for sharing um, your question and for the care you are providing to your wife, um, to your life partner. You know, you pose some excellent questions and concerns that I'm sure many people can relate to. You know, I think a first step is speaking with your wife's doctor, doctor and maybe um, getting information of some research related to what long-term care supports are available in your, in your area for her and for you. For example, respite care that you can go out without having to worry about her and to take the breaks you need. Your local area agency on aging may also have some specific resources for you. Fortunately, the Alzheimer's Association and National Institute on Aging have the resources on skill building that you're looking for. The Alzheimer's Association also has caregiver programs and support groups that are available remotely and are very helpful. In addition, the WellMed Charitable, well Charitable Foundation has ongoing program and services to support caregivers on a variety of issues, yours included. And I thank you for your participation and for writing in. There are so many skills that caregivers need and to develop as their caregiving journey changes and the needs of your care recipients of, you know, evolve, it does change. So I'm going to focus on one skill I think is most uh, universal for Alzheimer's caregivers, which are communication skills. You know, so communicating is so, so important. So 
Make eye contact and call the person by name. Be aware of your tone, how loud your voice is, how you look at the person and your body language. That says an awful lot. You know, use other methods besides speaking, such as gentle touching. Try to distract the person if communications creates a problem. You know, you could even take them out of the room or ask them to come join you for a cup of coffee. Encourage the person to communicate with you. Show a warm, loving, matter-of-fact manner. Hold a person's hand while you talk. To speak effectively with a person who has Alzheimer's. Offer simple step-by-step -step instruction. Repeat instructions and allow more time for response. Try to not to, in, uh, you know, don't try, <clears throat> excuse me, to argue with them. Don't talk about the person as if he, she, they are not there. Be direct, specific, and positive. So I'm saying an awful lot here. And I'm just wondering, I'm just looking at the time. I hope that this is helpful. Um, Elia, do we want to go to resources or do we want to a bit address the question that Evelyn fed, felt was not answered? <laughs> we will address Evelyn's question and I will share our resources on the screen. Um, <clears throat> Evelyn, do you want to ask your question again? Family dynamics, when is it absolutely necessary for a caregiver to place their loved one or care recipient? So I think we have answered the question throughout our program today, because that answer is going to be different for different people based upon different circumstances and realities. For example, is your home equipped for you to be able to take a loved one in? Um, are you coming to a place as outlined in some of the questions we received and answers where you might have to think of placing a loved one uh, for the benefit of your home environment and other people that you are living with. So um, unfortunately, there's no clean cut answer. Um, I think our series throughout the month has provided a lot of considerations in terms of aging in place, uh, what the situation is right now in long-term care, the challenges that people are facing um, getting a loved one placed, or, and if they are placed, receiving an adequate level of care because of staffing shortages. Um, we also know that admissions are down for Medicaid-eligible beds. So people are making decisions, as we discussed today, to take people in and have them live with you. But there are a lot of considerations that go with that. What about spouses who are alone in a community? Sorry? What, what about spouses? That's, you know, a couple who are alone in a community. That's where all those resources come in and are so important. We talked last week about um, aging friendly communities. And I think that that's very important because if you are aging somewhere, and I've discussed this before uh, using myself as an example, um, I'm in a community where I know that there are LGBTQ plus aging resources right nearby. Um, that's important for me. And that was part of our planning and consideration as we're getting older. So if you are aging and you don't have children, which is very common, or you might be living alone, as some of the research um, that we shared today suggests, people need to be planning more and thinking about what is available in their communities around them. Um, we mentioned this earlier in the series, too. If you just think about COVID, uh, which stores had senior shopping hours? Um, and which communities prioritize seniors to get vaccines and resources. Um, that gives you a big clue into what resources might or might not be available near you. I also want to say, Evelyn, it's a good question that you ask, what if the couple doesn't have any family and when is the time you know, to place? It's so individual. For some of the caregivers that I've spoken to throughout my career, one of the biggest issues that arises is incontinence. You know, when when one person, the caregiver feels that this is like, I can't do this. This is the point where I, and that's where people have to really look, really have to think about that if that's an issue and to really get the support and talk to somebody about that. So everyone is an individual situation and we there's no one thing that sort of decides. Even through our presentation today, if someone is getting up four or five times during the night to go to the bathroom, which is normal for that person, how does that affect you? Am I going to be able to get up in the morning and, and, and even, you know, 
plan a day or what if I'm working? What if I have children in the home? So it's very specific. So we kind of try to sort of, it, it's something that people need to plan ahead. And all the questions that we kind of posted is you do that work before. I know it's very heartwarming to think that you want to have the person that you love to stay with you or for that, you know, you might not love them to begin with, but we have to plan these things. You can't just decide on the spur of the moment because it's going to be a disaster. Well, maybe another general criteria, more general for placement would be that the care caregiver can no longer take care of themselves because of the burden. Well, for yeah. sure. Yeah, absolutely. 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 Well, you guys, again, have done such a wonderful job. This series has been fabulous. I have learned so much. You always give us the state of the art that's going on and, and deal with our emotional side too. So I thank you. I want all of our participants to know that you'll be getting a post-session questionnaire in the next couple of days. It will include all of these resources, um, links to them, and all of this fabulous resource list that Elliot has put together and added to over time. But you won't get it if you're not registered. So if you got this number from somebody else, please call our WellMed Charitable Foundation customer service line, 866-390-6491 and get registered. And then you'll also get the wonderful monthly calendar, which is out now for the month of November. And it's got all of the you know, great topics listed. We still have one left this month and that is with Dr. Uh, Jamie Heisman who is very popular in terms of presenting. He does a nice job. And he's talking about, he's had a little series this month too. He's talking about taking off your mask and being more real and being good with that. Um, and just saying how you feel about things. And I think when, when Lucy talks about communication, that's a really important part of it. People know they can trust you because you're always speaking what's true. So please, um, Get registered. We've got a lot of new sessions for next month. I would like to thank every one of you who are on the line today for participating and for what you do. It's a, such a tough job. And I'd also like to thank Elliot and Lucy for all the work that they did with this together. You guys are <laughs> amazing. And I'd like to thank the WellMed Charitable Foundation for sponsoring the Caregiver Teleconnection. And with that, I'm going to stop the recording and I want to just, you know, have hope you all have a great day. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.